to, you may be seated if you, if you can. Uh, we want to uh, straight away uh, listen to God's word. My name is Oscar Miss, uh, like it's been mentioned. And uh, by the grace of God, I'm one of the pastors in Deliverance Church in Umoja. Um, married to Jennifer. And I have a 12-year-old girl who's 12 but thinking like a teenager. Um, so we, I was telling some people I need to buy a dog. I don't like dogs, but I may need to buy a dog. But then I realized that I don't have a good uh, relationship with dogs. Somebody told me, why don't you get some CCTV cameras and put them in your house? Because at the rate at which things are going, I'm like, uh, very soon some people may start knocking on my door. So I want to make sure that I see them wherever I am. So I can take care of that good, beautiful girl in our house. Um, so that's my small family. I didn't come alone. I came with Pastor Richard. Pastor Richard is one of the pastors in DC. Moja. Come on, give him a round of applause in the house. I want to appreciate uh, the guys who've put this together. Uh, Moshigadi, the pastors, the bishop, uh, Bishop Jimmy, and Mama Bishop for... Uh, I want to believe God that uh, God will speak to us, minister to us. I'm praying that I don't finish my message today. I never do. I normally say for a technical reason because I want to be invited again. So I'll make sure that I don't finish it. But I want you to turn to your Bibles in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll read verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, and verse 22. I wanted to put your finger there. It's great to be in the midst of young people. Guys, I believe in young people, and I'll tell you why. Because I believe young people are not the leaders of tomorrow. They're the leaders of today. Did you guys know that almost 75% of the population of this country is made up of young people? That the biggest population, the biggest demographic in this country is 35 years and below. In fact, when you start getting to the 20s, it becomes even younger. It is said that in this nation... That it's now official if you're born before 1995, you're a minority. So, me who's standing here, I'm part of that minority group. The biggest population is made up of young people. And we believe that if young people can take up their place, you can be able to influence a big generation in this country and change this country for the better. Anyone who's ready to do that? Anyone ready to do that? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, we'll be reading verse 19, like I said, to verse 22. Put your finger there um, and listen to me. Um, on, the 20, on the 12th August, 1985, at 6.12 p.m., a flight Boeing 787SR, Japanese airline 123, took off from a local airport called Haneda, and it was destined to land at the Tokyo International Airport. It had 524 passengers, uh, 15 of them were crew, and the rest were passengers. And they took off at 6.12. Guys escorted by their families gets, get into the plane and the pilot uh, does all that they're supposed to do in getting people to understand that you're about to leave and they take off. 12 minutes into their flight, when they're about uh, almost 30,000 feet above sea level, the flight got into some problem. And the pilot tried to stabilize the plane, and he realized that uh, uh, things were getting tougher. The story says that for about 32 minutes, he was able to sub stabilize the plane in the air, uh, knowing that things were not getting good, were not looking good. Uh, when he realized things were tough, he, uh, in the cockpit, he communicates to the passengers and says, this is your pilot talking to you. Uh, we've experienced some problems with the flight. We may be forced to do a crash landing. Uh, uh, we don't know whether it's going to be safe, whether we land properly. But uh, put on and fasten your safety belts because things are not looking good. I wanted to picture yourself as one of the passengers in Japanese airline flight 123 on that fateful day. 
ready to go and meet your relatives wherever you're going, and the pilot communicates and says, things are not looking good, and you're 30,000 feet above sea level. If you are given an opportunity and a chance and you're told, just write one wish because you don't know whether we will land safely, all indicators show that we'll crash and there may be no one who will come out of this place alive. What is that one wish that you'd write down that if you crash land and you're gone forever, that something that can be given to your loved ones and they can be able to read that one wish that you have as a person. I want to give you about two seconds to think through. If you were sitting in that flight on that fateful day, what would that one wish be? That you'd want your people to remember you for? What would that one wish be? Think about it. See, the story of Japanese airline 123 may look far-fetched, but I want to draw your attention to the Bible of a man who was not in a flight or in a plane that was crash landing, but a man who knew, I'm living, I'm, 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 I'm living within my last days. I'm in my twilight days of my life, not because of his age, but because of what he stood for and where he was at that particular moment. A man who was in prison because he stood for Christ, preached the gospel, and is in a place where he, he realizes, you know what, my life is just about to be taken away. In fact, he says in that scripture, earlier verses, he says that for I'm already being poured out, this is the Apostle Paul. And he writes his, right, his last, uh, he writes some of his last things that he'd want his, the people around him to know about him, the, pe the things that he'd want, him, uh, he'd want people to do. He even puts down names of people that he'd want uh, to be greeted on his behalf before his life is poured out. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 19, he says this as he writes uh, some of his last writings before the guy is killed because of what he stood for. He says, Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. In verse 20 he says, Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. He's talking to a young man by the name Timothy who many scholars believe was a teenager uh, by this time. Verse 21, then he says, something that I picked from the scripture, and I was wondering, how comes among the greetings that this man was just about to die for his, for his faith, how comes among the greetings and the things that he writes, he was able to push in these few words in scripture? Is it because there was too much space that he needed to add more words? Was it because was it coincidental? Was it because he just wanted to fill up space? But then I realized, no, because in verse 21, he says, after you've greeted them, he says, do your utmost to come to me before winter. And then he continues to say, you blast greets you, as well as Pudence and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. And finally, in verse 23, he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And this man is doing this from prison, knowing that I'm in my last days. I'm just about to be killed for what I stand for. I'm just about to join my maker. But then he squeezes a word, some, some lines and some sentences in this, that I wondered, why would Paul put these words in here and tell Timothy, who was a young person, at that particular point, do your utmost to come to me before winter. I didn't come to preach to us. I came to talk to us as young people. And I want to talk to us and get us to understand that sometimes if you and I are not careful, you could be in a season that looks so good, but you don't realize sometimes there are seasons that may come that are not so good and you need to prepare for those not so good seasons that are ahead of us. And I think that's what Paul was telling Timothy. I want you to prepare. He tells him, do your best to come to me before winter. What was Paul talking about? Paul was talking about the seasons of life. He didn't talk about any other thing. He specifically talks about winter. And I want you to understand that the words that are put in the Bible are not put in the Bible coincidentally. Every word in the Bible, God had a great meaning behind it. He says, come to me. He says, do your utmost best. Do your best. It's like, if you read that sentence, it's like Paul is begging Timothy. He's telling him, once you've done this, 
take the scrolls that I left, I don't know where, and bring them to me. Greet so-and-so. So-and-so is sick. Make sure you say hi to this family. But as you do that, come to me. Come to me before winter. Don't allow winter to get you on the road as you're coming to me. Don't allow winter to get you where you are. Make sure you're where I am before winter. This man was talking about seasons. And I'm sure he was talking during summer uh, as you look at this scripture because he was referring to a far season called winter. He instructs him, take advantage of the season that you're in. You're in summer, Timothy. Come to me. Because summer is a good time for you to travel. Summer is a good time for you to walk around, to get to me. Make sure that you come to me because if winter finds you before you get to me, you may never get to where I am. You see, in Africa, we understand what summer is all about because we understand the heat, the hotness that we experience, especially in our weather, January all through. Uh, you know, what you call winter, what you call a cold season in Africa cannot be compared to a winter that somebody in the West would experience because summer is good. Summer, you can dress lightly. You can travel. During summer, you can do stuff uh, in the outdoor. Summer is so good because you're not inhibited, you know. Uh, during summer, there are things you can do that you can't do even in a cold season in a country like Kenya. But then Paul is talking to somebody who's in a, who's in a culture that knows what winter is all about because winter is totally different. Why would Paul tell Timothy and warn him about winter? Because he understood how hard and tough it will be for somebody to travel during winter. You see, winter is cold. Some countries would experience winter at minus 10, minus 30, going on the extreme, minus 50. It is so cold that during winter, you've got to buy a different, you know, different kinds of clothes for you to be able to survive during winter. It is so cold during winter that even people who drive in some of those countries will tell you sometimes you're forced to get different pairs, sets of wheels that will withstand the ice that comes during a season like that. Winter is so cold that if you didn't have electricity in your house, you wouldn't be able to survive. That's how bad and tough winter is. Winter can be so bad that even birds are sensitive to it. It is said that during winter, birds would migrate from Europe and come into Africa. Winter is so bad that even trees are so sensitive to winter, they would shed their leaves. That's how tough winter is. And Paul tells Timothy, I want you to make sure that you come to me before winter. Don't allow winter to get you where you are. Winter can be so tough that even movement is inhibited. People don't travel as much as they're supposed to do. In other words, there are things that you can do during summer that you cannot do during winter. The things that you love to do, you can't do them. And so Paul tells him, Timothy, I want you to know and understand the dangers of the season that is coming if you don't take advantage of the season that you're in in this particular time. I want you to come to me before winter. It's like Paul is telling Timothy, there's a period that you have between where you are and what is coming, and if you don't prepare in between that period, and that period that is coming gets you unprepared, you will never be able to do what you're supposed to do. But you see, the challenge is, and I'm talking to young people, is it is very difficult to convince a beautiful young 18-year-old who's enjoying their summer that winter is coming. When you have 1,200 likes on Instagram, you have people who are following you in their numbers, you have people who like your post every other day, you know what we do every morning? You know, you take that picture, you put on makeups and you still do filters on it and you post it and your friends are saying that's a good picture. How do I convince you that one time is coming when it will be winter and the experience you're having right now would be no more. You see, during summer, you look so young, you look so beautiful. When people look at you, you know, you, you know, this beautiful lady, heads will turn, this handsome young man, all the teenagers and the young people in DC, Zimmerman, want to coalesce around you after the service because you're, 
You're the guy that everybody wants to be around because you're in your summer. But you know, when winter comes, sometimes some of the things that you are able to do in a particular age, you will be able to do. You smile and people think you're crying. That walking style is faded. You walk, you, it's, you, you're walking forward and people think you're walking backwards. Winter has come. I want you to understand, if you and I don't take advantage of the season between the summer that you're in, the youthful life that you're enjoying, and know there's a winter that is coming, by that time, you will be unprepared. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. I want you to take advantage. I want you to understand, if you do not take advantage of your summer years, when your winter comes, things will be totally different. How do you prepare for the winter of life. You see, like I told you, it's difficult to tell a young person that that time will come. I remember when I was a teenager and somebody comes and introduces themselves and says, you know, I am 30 years old. I'm like, that guy is just about to die. That one. In a few years, that one is dying. And then somebody else comes and says, you know, I am 40 years. And I'm like, ah, that one is gone completely. If somebody comes and says, I am 50, I'm like, what are you still doing? Around. You see, I was 15, I was 16, I was 17, I was 18. And I thought you remain a 15, 16, 17 year old forever. forever. When I got to 25, I was like, these 35 year olds are too old. Then I got to 30. Then I got to 35. Then I got to 40. Then I passed my 40th year. And I'm like, man, this is the stage where I used to think people are just about to do what? It's hard to convince a young person that that time is coming. But if you and I, and that's what I've come to challenges, don't prepare between your summer years and your winter years, then it will be very easy for you to get to a point whereby life overwhelms you, where life puts you down as a young person, if you don't prepare within this time. And I came to talk to you and to help us on how do we prepare when we're in our summer years. Because you guys are in your summer years. You're young, you're energetic. You know? You guys know, have a taste of fashion. You guys can, I mean, if somebody came to you today and told you, I want us to go out. Uh, uh, but, but, I mean, you don't even need to consult anybody. Because you have the time. You have all the time that you need for you to travel around and do all the things that you, you're supposed to do. But you know, a time is coming when somebody comes and tells you, I want you to travel, you'll be like, uh, you know, I have a baby at home, eh? I have a wife at home that I need to consult. You understand what I'm talking about? You know, when I was young, in the youth, we used to have something called Roundy Mwenda. Do you know what Roundy Mwenda is? I mean, you leave home, you meet in church, and this guy says, so what's the plot today? He says, we are going to Nakuru. And you get into a matatu, go to Nakuru, no questions asked. You will leave on a Friday, you'll come back on a Tuesday. You try tell me that today. I mean, as much as we do want to be part of some round Mwendas, I'm like, you know what? I have a daughter in the house. I have a wife. I have responsibilities. There are things I used to do then that I can't do when. I can do now. And that's why I tell young people, you know what? When you're young, enjoy your youth. Cut off the bricks. Enjoy your youth. Because a time is coming when you won't be able to go for the camps that you're going right now as often as you want. You won't be able to go to, for those hikes. You won't be able to jump on the pulpit or dance in the, you know, the, 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 you, know, you know, dance like all the young people are dancing, you know, because winter has done what? Has caught up with you. What do you do? How do you prepare for your winter? I want to give you four things that would help you prepare for that time. You see, preparation, if you prepare for what is coming, they say, uh, then you're in a position to be able to overcome any situation that comes, comes your way. What do you do to prepare and make sure that winter doesn't affect you, winter doesn't overwhelm you? Number one, you must understand you will need to make choices. Say with me choices. Come on, say with me choices. Life is about choices. I mean, you make a choice to wake up in the morning. You make a choice to dress. You make a choice to go to school. You make a choice to eat. You make a choice to take a shower. 
Life is about choices. I mean, every day, you'll have opportunities to make either a good choice or a bad choice. But life is about choice. You can't just flow through life. You must learn and understand that life is about choices. In fact, I normally say it's a chain reaction of choices. Life is about choices. Something that you, never, you should never forget. That you and I will always be a product of our choices. You, we will always be a product of our choices. In fact, I like saying that you and I are the sum total of the choices that we made five years ago. I can be able to tell who you will become in the next five years by looking at the choices that you're making today. Because what you will be five years from now is the sum total of the choices that you're making today. Life is about choices. What choices will you make? As a young person, some of the challenges and the things that were thrown away is to make choices. We are to make choices whether we live straight, on the straight and the narrow, or do stuff that everybody else is doing. I remember I was in primary school many years, many, many years back. And we had this group of students, classmates who were around us, and some of them would come from very privileged families. Some of us didn't come from privileged families, so we didn't have uh, the luxuries that, 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 that they were afforded to have. And they would make all sorts of choices, you know, be, uh, be delinquent in school, uh, you know, you know, um, you know, get lost in drugs, uh, do stuff in terms of making sure that uh, they're causing all the trouble in class. Why? Because they knew we, we were coming from, from some very nice families here. And even if anything happens, I don't have a father who can take care of me. I have a father who can give me a good position at work, take me to a good college or take me to a good high school. I don't have to work as hard as everybody else. There was a young man that I remember, I'll never forget. His name is Philip, who was a classmate of mine. And every time this young man would come to school with a new pair of shoes, new pair of shorts, and a new pair of shirt, and a new pair of sweater, everything was new every time. Where I came from, we couldn't afford a new pair of uniform even in two, three, four years. You had to really work on that shirt until it gets tattered. You turn the collar around and you turn it again and you turn it again. This guy would come to school. Uh, we, 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 you know there was those two lunch boxes that had, I don't know how many layers, one, two, three, and four layers. Do you know those lunch boxes? Where you put soup, you have fruit, you have proteins, and you have carbohydrates at the same time. And during lunch hour, this guy would go and sit on that corner together with guys who are of his class, and they would sit and eat, while the rest of us are in school that are wondering, well, you know, the day when we had some good food, you know what we had? We'd, had, we would have some loaf of bread and some ice. I don't know if they do those ice nowadays. You know, you know, we used to buy them at a shilling. So when you have good money and you have going to enjoy some good lunch, you buy some loaf of bread, half a loaf of bread, you. You chimba kashimo katkati your bread. You squeeze in the ice, and then the ice melts the bread because you don't have money to buy a soda, and you eat the bread. But my friend Philip had everything that he wanted. I mean, long story short, we finished primary school. He goes to a very nice high school. Some of us went to some, some schools that we won't name because they didn't even afford to have nicknames, the schools that we went to. Finished high school, uh, go to college, I'm seated in my office. I think it was my second year as a youth pastor in D.C. Umoja. I sit in my office, 8 a.m. in the morning, and I hear a knock on the door. And I open because I was the only one in the office, and I open the door, and I see this guy who's so bushy with all beards around him, and I look at him, heavily built, and I'm like, who is this? And he asks me, you don't remember me? And I'm like, ah. the voice rings a bell, but I, I can't place you. Then he says, my name is Philip. He says, Philip, we were with you in primary school, and he names the primary school. And then he says, I was told by so and so that you work as a pastor in this church, and I need your help. And I ask him, what kind of help? He says, you know, I'm just from prison. All I want you to do is to buy me a ticket to go up country. And I knew it was true, because he used to come from Umoja when he went in primary school. That's where the parents used to stay. Buy me a ticket 
because if I stay in this city one more day, I'll go back to prison. And then he says, if you don't believe me, don't give me money, send somebody to country bus to buy a ticket and give it to me. Life is about choices. You become the sum total of the choices that you've made in life. I go into high school. I was in a day school in this city. And then, you know, when you go into, this, into day school, the first time your uniform is new, you're smelling new, everything is new. But I was in one of these interesting high schools where you, you couldn't leave your bag in class because somebody would steal your books. So we'd go with our bags to the tuck shop to buy some tea. So we, we get there and buy a cup of tea and all of a sudden there are these four young people who surround me and they come, they're talking to me and, and they started so well and they're like, what's your name? And I say, this is my name. What primary school were you in? And I tell them. And then all of a sudden one of them says, Suni bai ye chai. And I look at him and I'm like, Sina chapa a chai, all I have ni bus fare the whole week, Sina chapa. And then the guy says again, Suni bai ye chai, Sina pese a chai. Within no time, I had something spring. Up to now, I don't know how I got on my knees. All I saw was a tip of a pen knife on my belly. And the way my hands got into my pocket, got all the money and gave to them, I can never tell up to today. Went to the next class. There's a guy who we were with in the same primary school. He gives me money. I go back home. Long story short, from one, from two, from three, um, ask, I, I get some permission from school to go see a doctor. Uh, by lunch hour, I'm supposed to come back. It's lunch hour. I get to the gate of the school. There's a restaurant next to it. And I say, let me go in there and have some lunch. And I'm seated towards the end of the restaurant. And there's some three guys seated on that corner. And I'm eating. And all of a sudden, there's a guy who walks in and goes and sits with them. And I look at that guy and I remember, this is the same guy who took my money in high school. You know what I did? I, I, I decided, let me bend, let me just make sure that I cover my head, I concentrate on my plate, and I'm praying hard. God, don't allow this guy to come where I am. But I was in school uniform. And I hear him say, ah, ule mse, alikuile shule nilikuanga, wacha nene kamgote. And then I see the guy coming, and I was like, can I go into my pocket again, get all my money, Pull that on the table so that when he comes, he does what? He takes the money. So the guy comes to me and he says, ah, I'm saying, I don't mean to And then he tells me, I'm saying, Soma. Soma, I'm saying. Wanajua mini kiwa ichu enyu? Mimi siku wata nikeshi muazazi. Kazi yangu likuwa nikubuli watu. I almost felt like telling him I was one of your victims. <laughs> but you see, I'm like, if he bullied me when he was in school uniform, how much more when he's not in school uniform? So me, let me behave. So he gives me a pep talk and goes. Life is about choices. What you become today is the sum total of the choices that you make now. I want you to write this down as you go to the next point. If you can choose today what others will not choose, you'll be able to choose later what others cannot choose. That's a play of English words. I want to repeat it. If you can choose today what others will not choose, you'll be able to choose later what others cannot choose. If you can choose today what others will not choose, you'll be able to choose later what others cannot choose. You see, you in your summer, you have the power to make some certain choices. When you get to winter, you'll not have that power either because of age or responsibility. If you can choose today what others will not choose, you'll be able to choose later what others cannot choose. A story that illustrates this better is a story of a movement called True Love Waits. A group of uh, True Love Wait uh, ambassadors go into a high school every week uh, in one of the states in the U.S., and they go to this particular high school. And then for the couple of months they've been going there, they realize everybody is sexually active in the school. And they go in every other week to talk to them on, on why they should abstain and, you know, stay away from sex before marriage. And they realize, man, I, I mean, a big percentage of these students are all sexually active. They've all been engaged in sex. Then they realize there's like a small number of students that has not been engaged in sex. And one of the students was a girl that will name Rachel. So they're like, this Rachel has never been engaged in sex. So one, one week they're walking into the hallway, getting prepared to go and talk to them, and they meet Rachel. 
And they stop Rachel and they, ah, Rachel, hi, how are you? One of them does that. And Rachel says, I'm fine. And they call her and say, you know, Rachel, one of the things that we realize as we come to this school, that so many young people in this school are sexually active. But we've realized that you've not engaged in sex. You've committed yourself to abstain before marriage. Does that bother you? Do they, do they give you a hard time because of that? Do they call you names? And Rachel looks at them and says, you know what? Every day they call me names when I, tell, when I tell them I'm a virgin. They tell me I'm a shade. I'm a waste of beauty. But then Rachel makes a statement that I've never forgotten up to today. When that guy asks, but that, that doesn't bother you, she says, no, it doesn't bother me. Because when they tell me that, I look at them and I tell them, any time I can choose to be like you. But at no time can you choose to be like me. If you can choose now what others will not choose, you'll be able to choose later what others cannot choose. Number two, not only do you prepare and learn to make great choices in life, but you've got to build character. As a young person, you've got to build character. You see, the foundation you build today will sustain you in your winter years. You build a good foundation now, you get to your 25 years, 30 years, 35, 40 years, you will have put together a good foundation that will help you to be able to navigate the toughness or, 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 or when life is so turbulent, you'll be able to navigate because of the foundation you've built. And how do you build that foundation? You make sure you build good character. You've got to build, you've got, you've got to have what I call an inner value system based on God's word. What do you value? Value system just simply means you put down things that you value. And those are things that we call the non-negotiables. That you know what? Come rain, come shine. I am not compromising on this. Like Rachel said, there'll be no sex before marriage. No compromise. An inner value system based, based on God's word. Or like Joseph in the Bible in the book of Genesis. When Potiphar's wife comes to him and says, I want you to sleep with me because you're so handsome and so good looking. Joseph looks to, at her and says, how can I commit such a great sin? Against my who? Against my God. I have a value system. There are things I will not touch. There are places I will not go. There are things I will not involve myself in. They are non-negotiables. You know what? I learned to do that very early. I, used to, I took a book and started writing six values that I told myself my life will be built on these values. Integrity responsibility. You know, before I got married, I said abstinence was one of them. I'm not going to engage myself in some of these things. And I'll keep on reading those things to myself every other time and every other day. An inner value system that is based on God's word. It's important for you to build an inner value system that is based on God's word. Number three, very quickly, you've got not only to make good choices, build character, but you need a consistent sense of urgency. Good choices, build character, a consistent sense of urgency. And I'm saying that because unfortunately sometimes we think we remain the same year in, year out. You are 15 today, you are like me. I never used to think when I was 15, I'll ever get to 30. You don't understand when that clock goes round, the time doesn't remain the same. In fact, you're older now than you are at 2 p.m. today. As a youth pastor, a friend of mine, a girl in our church, calls me one day and says, Pastor, pray for me. And I'm like, why are you crying? She says, pray for me. And I'm like, what's the problem? It's my birthday. And I'm like, I thought when it's your birthday, you need to be what? You got to be happy. And excited because it's your birthday. But she says, pray for me, it's my birthday. And I'm like, so what's wrong with your birthday? I'm afraid to get old. <laughs> and I'm like, how old are you? I'm turning 23. So on the other line, I had to tell her, by the way, you're getting very old. Eh? You see, every minute that passes, you grow older and older and older. That's why you can't go through life thinking I'll remain the same forever. I have an issue when I'm walking through town and you meet young people who have no sense of urgency, especially when you're driving 
and you stop to give them some space to cross the road, and instead of walking very fast, they have all those, you know, air pods in their ears, and they're walking like they're cat catwalking for you on the, on the streets of Nairobi. I mean, no sense of urgency. Because we think we'll remain 16, 18 forever. I've got some bad news for you. Next year, you'll be older than this year. In two years' time, ah, you do, do me this favor. Write down your age on a piece of paper. Write it down very quickly. My time is, is flying very fast. Write down your age. And then put there a plus. Five. Equals, that's how you'll be old you'll be in the next five years. That's how old you'll be in the next five years. You see, young guys, we can't afford to live through life without a sense of urgency. We must realize that, you know what, let's take advantage of where we are and do stuff. You know, go through the pain today so that we'll play tomorrow. Unfortunately, we want to play today. We don't realize you play today, you'll go through pain tomorrow. In fact, there's somebody who says, pay today and enjoy tomorrow, or play today and pay and pay tomorrow. I don't know what you want to be. You cannot afford to live through life without a sense of urgency. A story is told of a community in Zimbabwe who are like our Maasai's. And then they would send their young people to go and graze their cattle in a far village when there was drought. So this young man is given about 100 cows by the father and is told, you go to that far village because there's no rain in our side. Go take them out there and then and let them you know, get, get our cows to graze. But then they tell him, in our culture, because between our village and that village there's a big river, when it's dry, the river is dry. But they tell him, when you see rain on our side, you need to start coming But when you get to the banks of the river, never try to cross it when it's raining because the water will do what? Will sweep, will sweep you down the river. What you do is that when you get to the banks of the river, take the first cow, hang on its tail, and the cow will drag you across the river to the other side. And the young man takes the hundred cows and goes, and he's grazing the cows, doing very well, and after a few weeks, looks on the other side and sees some you know, dark clouds and realizes it's raining on the other side, just like my elders told me. And he gets busy to take the cows back home. The 100 cows gets to the river and he looks at his 100 cows and he tells himself, you know what? I have 100 cows. All I need is one tail. I can cross the river in style. So he says, mm, let the first five cows go. How many cows did he remain with? And he's like, what do I need 95 cows for? All I need is one tail. Another five go. How many cows did he remain with? And then he's, he's just thumping and he's saying, you know what? I only need one tail. I think these elders didn't know what they were talking about. Why, why the first one? I can, I, I, I can use any and cross in style. Another ten go. How many cows did, did he remain with? Another ten cows go. How many did he remain with? Seventy cows. And the guy is just thumping. Just like sometimes we tell ourselves, you know I'm young. These things I will do them when I'm 20. I'll do these things when I'm 25. Allow me to enjoy life, you know. You know, you, know, you, you, you old guys don't understand. You're not with it. If, if you're where we are right now, you'd also enjoy life. I am young. I am beautiful. I am strong. I am handsome. 20 more cows go. How many remained? 50 cows. Another 10 go. How many remained? And the guy is saying, you know, what do I need 40 cows for? All I need is one tail. 20 cows go. How many remained? 20 cows. 10 go. How many? 10. And the guy you'd think would jump on the next cow, but it's still like, you know, all I need is one tail. Five cows go. How many remained? Five cows. And the guy, just like some of us here, who keep on telling ourselves, you know, you know those of us who used to study during third term, form three third term. You remember those guys? I don't know about you. Some of us were in that group. I mean, it has form three third term. I have all the time. I'll do all the things that I need to do then. 
four cows go. How many cows did he remain with? And the guy now is like, now I need to get on this car and jump on the other side. And it's ready to jump on that car only to realize the cow has no tail. And the cow passes and goes on the other side because the guy did not have a sense of urgency. He didn't have a sense of urgency. Listen to me, young guys. You want to be ahead of your generation, you must do what your generation does not do. If you do exactly what your generation does, you'll be at the same point with your generation. You must say, if they wake up at 7, I'll be up by 5. I mean, I mean we, 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 we do something called doulos in our church. This is a group of high school graduates, ex-candidates, and take them for about six months through a program. And I did that for a long time. And I remember one time I asked this, these young guys who had just finished school, why are you coming late for the program? And somebody would say, you know what, Pasi, Nikiwa Shule, Joe, you know we used to wake up at three, to na cold shower, I love to end up preps. So I Maliza Shule, I couldn't have learned I'm three, I'm four. It's payback time. Then I told them, when you get to 30, if you continue sleeping like this, when you get to 30, calculate the number of hours you have slept. Some of you will be so shocked you'll have slept more than half your lifetime. You're 30 years and you've slept for 17 years. Sense of urgency. Finally, choices, character, consistent sense of urgency. You need a compelling vision. You need a compelling vision. The Bible says where there's no vision, people perish. And this is why some young people don't, you know, do well, or we, get them, we have them getting lost in all kinds of things, is because of a lack of vision. You need a compelling vision. Something that will make you hate the nights. Something that will make you want to wake up every other day because you want to pursue it. That thing that gives you sleepless nights. You're saying, you know what, I am 15, but I'm seeing not just 16, 17, I'm seeing 20, I'm seeing 25 years. This is what I want to be. This is what I want to become. And I'll give you a vision if you say I don't have a vision. You see, the Bible says in Acts chapter 13 and verse number 36 that David served God's purposes in, in his generation before he died. David transformed his generation. So you're saying I don't have a vision, I'll give you a vision. Can you purpose today that I'll be an influence in my generation? I will impact my generation. I'll stand out from my generation. And have a compelling vision that everything that I do will help me leave a mark. You see, I, I get so amazed with the life of Jesus. It's not so, Jesus only lived for 33 years. When you look at his life, you're like, it is not how long you live, it is the kind of impact. It is not the duration of your life, but it's the impact that you live. What's your vision? Where do you see the next five years, the next ten years? I challenge young people and tell them when you write it down, put it down, describe it on a piece of paper. And one of those should be, I want to make sure that every person that comes across me is impacted. I told you that everybody was born before 1995 is a minority. Can I tell you? The best placed people can change your generation are not the old guys. It is you. Because you understand their language. The age gap is not so big. If some of us went to speak to some people, they'll be like, this one is too old. But you know what? You go and model a lifestyle of Christ, you'll be able to influence and impact people. May that be part of your compelling vision. That you'll say, I'm not just living for myself, but I want to make sure that I leave a mark. Do you remember Simon Maconde? Do you remember Simon Maconde? Oh, you guys are too young. You never did Simon Maconde. You, you never did Simon Maconde. Okay, let the old school guys here remind you of Simon Maconde. You see, Simon Maconde was an interesting fella. It is said, I almost said the Bible says, eh? it is said he was born on a Monday. He was named on a Tuesday. I think he was baptized on a Wednesday. He, was, uh, he, got, he got married on a Thursday. He got sick on a Friday. He was second to hospital on a Saturday. He was, I think he died on a Saturday and he was buried on a Sunday. And that is all about? I mean, you don't want your life to be like that. 
where you just at a statistic, you want to change lives. You want to impact society. You want to have a compelling vision. Are you understanding me, guys? I want you to understand, um, and I, I want to do this as I, as I close. I've closed my Bible, so that's done. I was just talking to Pasi in the office about high schools and primary schools. Five years ago, I made up my mind, as old as I am, and said, any school that is around me, I'll make sure there's my footprint in that school. And I purposed that once a week I'll step into a school and get a group of about young people and mentor, talk to them, and inculcate values. As I'm talking right now, 500 down. How many? How many? 500. Paid up, not paid up. Because I made up my mind a long time ago that, listen, I will be a solution to the problems of the society. I will not just float through life. I want to make sure that I impact somebody else's life. But you see, do you think I go there alone? No. I decided, you know what? Some, some of us, our age gap between us and some of these guys is too huge. So I took alongside some young people and said, can I coach you to do what I am doing? And right now, the last term, this past term, I didn't even step to any school in our neighborhood. But the guys that we've coached stepped into that school and they were able to hit at least 150 students in high school. In high school, 600 kids in primary schools. You want to make sure that you have something that will help you be a contribution to society and not just draw from it. I want to have a compelling vision. And that's what I want to challenge you today as I bring this to a close. That would God help you as a young person and say, you know what, as young as I am, I want to make sure that I leave a mark. So it, is not, it will not be how long I live, but it will be what did I contribute to society. I have made good choices. I'm building good character. I have a consistent sense of urgency. I know there's no time because the king's business requires haste. And then number two, I have a vision that is bigger and beyond me. I want to change those who are in my sphere, those who are in my space. You can do it. You can do it. I told you the best prophet to your generation. It's not the older guys. You are the best prophet to your generation. And if you take it up and say, I will do it, I'll tell you in the next five years, we'll be talking about a great future and a hope for this country. Because some young people in D.C. Zimmerman decided, I'll not just add to the numbers. I will contribute to the transformation of society. I want you to stand so that I can pray together with us before I hand back this microphone. Remember I asked you, if you're in flight one, two, three, what is that one thing you don't want people to remember you for? I want you to close your eyes for a second. You and I are not in flight one, two, three. And God is keeping and sustaining us and preserving our lives. But then what is that one thing that you do want to be remembered? What will be your contribution in society? I want you to close those eyes for a second and just think about it. What will be your contribution? What is that one thing that I will do? To make sure that as I grow in the things of God, I contribute to the community around me. I want to be a change agent. I want to transform the world. I want to change society. What is that thing that you will do as a young person? Or will you just be counted among the numbers? Father, we pray that you'll help us take advantage of the sum of our lives. When we have energy, we have strength, we have style, we have psych, we have the morale. That, Father, when the winter days come, none of us will regret. But we'll all be saying we did what we were supposed to do during summer. We'll be prepared for any eventuality as the future comes. And I pray for every person who's listening to me, the young people under, the, under my voice. I want to pray that none of them will get lost. But, Lord, we will all be challenged to make the right choices, to build great character to have a consistent sense of urgency. And you'll give us a compelling vision, not just for our benefit, but a compelling vision to transform the world around us. 
So I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God bless you.